turning to the sermon for today. Grace and peace to you in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've said it once. We can't say it too much more, too many times. Summer is officially here. Officially, uh, school is out, and I know we're all excited about that. Even for those of us who aren't directly to related to the school calendar, this is a time that usually brings trips, right? Trips to see loved ones, trips to a new place, maybe just for vacation. I actually was uh, in the car going home the other day, and um, the radio station, I, uh, one of the radio stations I listened to had a whole playlist of summer road trip songs, which is really fun to listen to. Um, a great part of any trip, I think, is the preparation for a trip. That's, I won't say half the fun, but it's a good amount of the fun is preparing for a trip. Um, I'm going to date myself here. I'm a child of the 80s, and my parents were uh, members, we were members of AAA. Um, and does anybody else remember the triptychs from AAA? <laughs> so these were uh, maps that were on flip charts on a spiral notebook, and it mapped out your entire road trip journey. And so as you journeyed, you'd keep flipping up to the next route and roadway. So um, if you take a long road trip, this was actually great. And I remember my parents, you know, we'd get a triptych and I'd grab it and flip through um, the route that we'd be taking and just think like, we're going to go to this city. We're going to be in this state. We're going to go past this lake, um, things like that. And I remember that being really exciting. Uh, I know uh, we use these travel books. Does anybody else love travel books? I love travel books. Uh, whenever you're taking a trip, especially to a place you've never been before, a travel guide is super helpful. Um, or even a travel memoir. Have you done this before? Read about someone else's experience? It's not so much recommendations like a travel guide, but someone else's experience. Actually, travel memoirs written from, say, 100 years ago, super interesting. I recommend those highly. They give a nice perspective on how things have changed in a place. Anyway, I think you can tell I, I must need a trip because <laughs> I could talk about trips for a long time, and it's that season. And so it's, actually, it's super appropriate that we get this gospel reading um, in our, uh, this year is the year of Luke, so we've been coming back to the gospel of Luke here. And this gospel reading from Luke fits so nicely into the beginning of summer and trip taking. Up to this point, we've seen Jesus in Galilee, that northern part of Israel. So chapters 3 through 9 are chock full of miracle making by Jesus up in Galilee. And then we get to this portion of chapter 9, the end. And there's an abrupt change that happens here. And it happens right in our gospel passage. Chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. So with these words, we're cued into a new time in Jesus' ministry, very different from what we've seen before. It's a time when Jesus makes a deliberate shift of mission, one to go to Jerusalem, the place where he will be rejected in the fullest sense and be put to death and die and rise again. That, that phrase, set his, set his face, it's, it's so descriptive. You can imagine it. It shows mission. It shows determination, deliberation. He will not be deterred, even knowing what awaits him. So to bring us back to this idea of trip, Jesus is embarking on a trip here, a trip to Jerusalem to save us from ourselves. And this trip to Jerusalem runs from 951, what we've got in our gospel, into chapter 19, when he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and people welcome him, thinking he's a different sort of king. That's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. So biblical scholars call this, this 10-chapter chunk of Luke, the travel narrative, the travel story of Luke, kind of like the travel memoir of which I spoke a bit ago. So in Luke, we find him writing about what happened along the way. And in the next months of our own being in Luke, we'll hear from Jesus do a lot of teaching 
a lot of teaching, a, a lot of teaching about his way of living and how it's different from the way of the world. This travel narrative starts out not with a story of a win, not of a story of a win or success as we might like it to. It starts out with a story of rejection. So Jesus and his disciples have come to a village in Samaria. It's an area that was in the old northern kingdom of Israel. And so as I think most of us know, the relations between the Samaritans and the Jewish peoples who were from Jerusalem, the southern part, were not good. They were hostile even. So Jesus sends messengers to check things out and, and then does come into the village. And Luke tells us that people don't receive him. Now we don't, I always like to look for what, what scripture tells us and what it doesn't. We don't know exactly what happened there, right? We don't know how they rejected him. Was it physical? Was it a kind of escort to the town boundary? Was it they just ignored him? Did someone yell at Jesus? We don't know, but it must have been pretty clear rejection and serious enough for James and John. This is pretty serious. Did you catch what they say? Should we rain down fire on them? Pretty violent. Yeah, so whatever the rejection was, it was, it was pretty for certain that they didn't want to listen to Jesus in this new way that he spoke of. And, in, you know, this, this, I, this calling raining down fire actually comes from, there's some precedent for that. The prophet Elijah did that in 1 Kings. We also, another reason they could be saying this is, interestingly, if you want to take a look in your Bible when you get home, before this chapter, before, just a few verses before, there's been discussion between the disciples about who's the greatest. And so here we see James and John saying, well, why don't we uh, call down fire on them? So maybe this is James and John trying to show authority. Maybe they had a hankering for authority and they wanted to, to show it off a bit. So whatever the reason was, whatever the motivation of James and John was, we know Jesus. What we do know is Jesus' reaction. And his reaction is to rebuke them. And then he simply moves on to the next village. So violence was not the answer to rejection of Jesus' good news. Judgment by James and John, human judgment was not the answer to rejection of Jesus. The answer was to move on and then to look at one's own commitment to Jesus. In the very next verse, verse 57, if you have it handy there, it says, as they were going along the road, so the conversation begins what being a disciple really entails. Luke relates three interactions, each representing real life concerns, real life ties. The first person tells Jesus they will follow him wherever he goes, and Jesus fills him in that his mission leaves him without a home. The next wants to go bury his father, a familial obligation, and Jesus responds that does not supersede his mission. And finally, we get that request of the person to go say goodbye to his family. That seems very reasonable, doesn't it? But Jesus responds that looking back is just not part of this mission deal. He uses this analogy of plowing a field. And you can't plow a field, Jesus says. You can't do that while looking back. Make those lines all crooked. So this is how Jesus' travel story Jerusalem starts out. Rejection of the good news. Continuing the journey. And then looking at one's own discipleship. Now, we're reading this story about Jesus setting his face toward Jerusalem, but this walk, we soon realize, this walk to Jerusalem also shows us what our walk of discipleship is like. Remember that phrase in verse 57, as they were going, going along the road. That can also, that word translated road, can also be translated way. They were going along the way. And some of you might know an early name for Christians in antiquity was the way. The Christian movement was called the way. So this travel narrative of Jesus' way to Jerusalem is also our own story. We can claim it as our own story of our way in Christ. 
And in this way, as I think all of us know, there will be rejection. Discipleship involves being rejected by the world. This rejection can play itself out in so many ways, I mean, countless ways. I mean, the most obvious way is if you're in conversation with someone and you introduce the good news of Christ in some way, and they make it known they want nothing to do with it. But rejection comes in so many subtler and quieter ways, ways that sometimes we don't even, we don't even know about. Maybe the rejection has come to you in the way you've chosen to live your life. Maybe in the way you were in a relationship with a friend or a loved one or a decision you made at work that came from your own faith. And because of the way you acted in faith, you were rejected. The way of living Jesus advocates, the way we learn more in the story of Jesus traveled to Jerusalem is so different. Jesus is going to tell us, you need to invite people to dinner. Sit and eat dinner with people you just wouldn't normally. Spend your money to help others. And there's so much more Jesus is about to tell his disciples and to us on this travel to Jerusalem. But the thing we learn here right off the bat is that we can expect rejection. How do we deal with that? As Jesus shows in our scripture, you keep moving that's what this story shows us. You keep moving. It reminds me of, I played uh, high school basketball, and uh, we had the unfortunate uh, luck to have to um, have our practices early morning, early morning, 6 a.m. basketball practice, <laughs> which was terrible. It really weeded out people, though, so it, you had to really want to play basketball. And uh, we would do sprints, especially early in the season. So we would be sprinting like at six, you know, running lines at 6.15 in the morning. And the sun, in Minnesota, the sun comes up so late in the wintertime. So we'd be looking for the sun as like the time to like go to class. Anyway, um, we'd be doing sprints. And I remember our coach saying, just don't stop. I know you're tired, but just slow down. You got to keep moving. And in that moment, I thought to myself, that is crazy talk, because I just want to slow, I want to stop, and maybe move very slowly, but I know I, I just need a break, and I need to stop. And he said, if you do, you're just going to have a lot of trouble keeping on going. You're probably not going to start again. And I thought of that when I, with this story of Jesus, and the movement that Jesus continues, this keep on moving movement for Jesus. Don't stop. Don't stay, keep seeking, keep trying to live your life according to the good news of this different way of life in Christ. And in that moment, just as Jesus and his followers literally walked along to another town, we see that discipleship or following Christ isn't as easy as we might think it is for ourselves. Jesus' interaction with those three followers Highlight the strong human needs and ties, home, family obligation, familial, true love. The thing is, these will always vie for number one in our lives. But the number one slot belongs to God, even in the face of home and family. And there's a reason, we say it so much, there's a reason the first commandment is the first commandment. We spend our lifetime trying to get that right, and we get it wrong time and time again. We put other things before God, family and home, desires, success, and in so doing, we do reject God and God's proper place in our life. And then we see it. We're not so different from those who reject Christ outright, because we do that too. We are in constant need of God's forgiveness. The constant need of God who literally knows, God literally knows we can't get it right. And so came to us in Christ to wash us from our sin and then to make us new, to try again. And then we find ourselves as we should with our eyes on Christ. One thing I love about the sanctuary is you can't help but walk in here and look up. We had a service of servicemen here the other day 
and we, we were walking down the church and uh, he turned around and his eyes just literally went up um, because of the roof and then they came up here. You just cannot not look up at the cross. And that's where the eyes, that's where our eyes belong. Up on Christ. So if we want to extend this travel metaphor, which I will happily do because it's travel. If we want to extend this tra travel metaphor, let's just for a minute think of Jesus as a travel guide. Now that fail, I know it's just almost, it's terrible to say because Jesus is so much more than a travel guide. Um, any metaphor for Christ falls short, but we'll use it just for a little bit because I don't know, have any of you been on a tour group before, like in a foreign country or seen them? You see them in New York City all the time. A group of people, usually from a, a foreign place here, or if you've been part of it somewhere else, and they're being taken around by a travel guide. Um, I've seen this in, in New York City. So for me, the first trip I ever took internationally was to the Holy Land and to Greece in college with my church, actually, my church. And um, we were in Israel, and our guide there was a Palestinian man, and he was rather short. He was just a wealth of information and he had this gentle spirit and this is my first trip ever outside of the country in a very different place a place I had never been and I remember being in this group and sometimes losing track of where he was and I got a little anxious about that where'd he go where where are we headed next I have a question where is he and I remember him he had a handkerchief and he would throw it up in the air and wave it in the air and all of a sudden, that one wave, I thought, ah, oh, okay, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. If we think about that travel guide, if we think about that in the, in the context of our own trip taking, in our lifetime trip of being Jesus' disciples, we follow him, the one who walked the path already, who knows, who knows rejection will come, and who knows that we will reject him too. But he calls us to keep going. That's our call. Keep going. And keep our eyes on him while you do it. Because he is a savior who will never let us go it alone. Amen. <laughs>